Okay. So first I want to just say a word or two to indicate what we're aiming to do in this lecture. So first of all, there's Chern-Simons theory in three dimensions. where the Lagrangian, or the action, is a multiple of the Chern-Simons form. And then we have a path integral, possibly with some um, knots included. If we want to include a knot, so we're in a three manifold, and possibly we have a knot so a knot is an embedded circle. We think of the knot, that happens to be what's called the trefoil knot, I believe. We think of the knot as the path of a charged particle in space-time. And then we include a factor, which is the trace of the holonomy in some representation of the gauge field integrated around the knot. And this is formally a topological invariant. And in fact, there are some subtleties about framing. But essentially, in the quantum theory, this is a topological invariant. And moreover, it's exactly computable because of its connections with two-dimensional mathematical physics. If there's time at the end of the lecture, I'll say a few words about how it's computed. When you compute it, you find the following. And I'm going to state this now just for the case of knots in R3. Knots in R3 are almost the same as knots in S3, but there's an important factor. The, uh, it's analogous to the fact that, as was shown here in Santa Barbara some years ago, um, there's an anomaly in relating a straight Wilson line in N equals 4 on R4 to that on S4. So had we been on S3, there's a more complicated answer. I definitely want to state the path integral for knots in R3. So when you compute this quantity, one finds that this path integral, which of course depends on the knot, is a Laurent polynomial in Q. with integer coefficients. Sorry, sorry. Q is, constru- is a certain function of the level. H is the dual Coxeter number. And the exact answer turns out to be a Laurent polynomial in Q with integer coefficients. So this can be proved using any of the methods by which um, this integral is calculated, which all involve somehow its relations to two-dimensional mathematical physics, conformal field theory, integral statistical mechanics, and so on. But none of those explanations make it terribly natural why the Jones polynomial and its cousins, J is for Jones here, because if R is the two-dimensional representation of SU2, this is the Jones polynomial. By the way, it's called a polynomial because it's a Laurent polynomial in Q. That's what the the second word in the name Jones polynomial means. None of the explanations based on two-dimensional mathematical physics make it terribly natural why the Jones polynomial is a polynomial. You can prove it, but it's not extraordinarily natural. Now, uh, starting with I. Frankel and then coming to fruition with his student, Kovanov, uh, an explanation of this fact emerged. And the explanation is that there is a Hilbert space. Well, Hilbert goes in quotes. There is a vector space. Physicists usually call the spaces of physical states Hilbert spaces, even when they're dealing with non-unitary theories which is z times z graded. That just means that there are two conserved quantities. H and F, I'll call them. H, you could call a Hamiltonian. 
f you could call a fermion number. And a trace in this Hilbert space of q to the h times minus 1 to the f is equal to the Jones polynomial or its cousins. So h depends on the representation and also the knot. So, okay. Two conserved quantities that generate the group u1 times u1. So they both have integer eigenvalues. So you see, this form, well, just by hand, any function of this kind can be written like so. We simply interpret a sub n as the z2 graded dimension of a vector space on which h has eigenvalue n. So the fact that the Jones polynomial is a moral polynomial with integer coefficients uh, was eventually interpreted by Kovanov in terms of the existence of this bigraded, natural bigraded vector space associated to the knot, such that a trace in this bigraded vector space gives you the Jones polynomial. Now, there's more information in the Kovanov theory there, than there is in the Jones theory. And the reason is that when we take minus 1 to the f, we're only counting f mod 2. But we could have, th there's a richer set of invariants. We could have taken the trace of q to the h times y to the f, introducing a new variable. And that would be a more general knot invariant that, in fact, contains strictly more information than is contained in the Jones polynomial, even if you generalize the Jones polynomial to all groups and all representations. So Kovanov theory definitely has more information. Now, from a physical point of view, or perhaps even from a mathematical point of view, uh, what having a Hilbert space associated to the knot ought to mean is that there's a fourth dimension. So we expect that instead of m3, we should be going to m3 times r, where we think of r as being time. Then um, on m3, we have the path integral, which gives a number. But if we have a theory on m3 times r, we would have, from the Hamiltonian point of view, a space of physical states. And um, so if there is a theory in M3 times R, and instead of uh, a vector space, you wanted a number. See, it's hard to see how to introduce a fourth dimension, but it's easy to see how to get rid of one. If you don't want the fourth dimension, you take your four manifold to be M3 times a circle. And then the path integral will give a number. And the number will be a Z2 graded trace. Here, the Z2 grading is just that fermion, fermionic states will contribute with minus sign in the trace. So it'll be a Z2 graded trace or a super trace in H, which was the space of physical states. So the interpretation of Kovanov theory ought to be that Chern Simon's theory in three dimensions comes from a four dimensional theory, which, when you compactify in a circle, reduces to Chern Simon's theory. Uh, any questions about what I've said? Yes? I, I would think of M3 cross R as uh, giving an evolution between states rather than a single state. Well, 
if you want. In, top, in a topological field theory, there won't be much evolution. So, uh, <laughs> uh, sorry. We could make evolution. Sorry. Since there's a knot here, we could introduce evolution as follows. So maybe I should explain this because, okay. If the knot is just sitting in space for all times, so first of all, what would it mean to include a knot? So if we are introducing a fourth dimension, but the knot is part of the Hilbert space, the, def the definition of the Hilbert space depends on the presence of the knot. The, the four-dimensional picture should be that the knot is present for all times. So the world volume of the knot uh, is the support of what Gukov and I called a surface operator. We did a lot of work on surface operators in gauge theory, where we weren't able to understand Kovanov homology, but we were able to apply them to the ramified case of geometric Langlands. But the knot should correspond to a surface in four dimensions. But Kovanov and other mathematicians did something that goes beyond defining a Hilbert space for a knot. Once you have this picture, you could imagine starting with a knot in the past and a different knot in the future, and then building a surface that interpolates from one knot to the other. So it's actually known in the context of Kovanov homology that you can do this. Um, given a two-dimensional surface, th this is what's called a knot coportism. So you have an initial knot C and a final knot C prime. And you get an operator that depends on the surface, which maybe we'll call D. And psi D maps the Hilbert space of C to the Hilbert space of C prime. And only depends on the topology of D, not on details of the geometry. Yes? I, I actually use the standard physical terminology, but it might have been too much of an abbreviation. The standard terminology, you could say that the Hilbert space is a, 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 depends only on M3. But a standard way of realizing it is to take a time-independent situation in which you quantize and you associate. If there, if there was a Hamiltonian, we would associate the physical state to an initial value surface. But we can skip that part in a topological field theory and just say that the Hilbert space is associated to M3 times R. You might consider it more natural, and from your question, I think you did consider it more natural, to associate the Hilbert space to an initial value surface in M3 times R. Yes? So, you know, in mathematics, we also use a four manifold to mean cover So we took that three manifold, the first time we yes. found the four manifold. <laughs> well, I'm not, although I'm not going to answer yes to that question, there will be a fifth dimension after a little while. So the answer might be yes, but I'm not going to offer you a yes right now. Now, it isn't straightforward to get Kovanov to, to introduce a fourth dimension in Sharon Simon's theory and get anything nice. The reason it isn't straightforward is that the churn simons form is special to three dimensions. There's no churn simons 4 form that in any sense reduces to a churn simons 3 form in three dimensions. So I'm not expressing dogma, just experience. There's no way to write a classical four-dimensional theory that in any sense by classical dimensional reduction reduces to churn simons theory in three dimensions. And in a sense, we're going to find out that the reason you can't do it classically is that in the gauge theory description that leads to Kovanov homology, the gauge group is the Langlands or GNO dual of the gauge theory in the Chern Simons description. So it isn't a classical um, story. It's a story that uses Montone and Olive or electric magnetic duality in four dimensions. 
So we're going to do this in stages. First, we're going to promote churn Simon's theory in three dimensions to a four-dimensional theory. Then we're going to apply electric and magnetic duality. And then we will introduce a fifth dimension. And we will have topological invariance in four of those five dimensions. I answered no yesterday to Mike Friedman when he asked if it was a five-dimensional theory, meaning it wasn't a five-dimensional topological field theory. But there will be a fifth dimension in the construction. And eventually, we'll come out with a proposal that, from a mathematician's point of view, is a perfectly concrete proposal, and moreover, manifestly topologically invariant, for the definition of the Kovanov invariance. I should say that the right answer has already been proposed in the physics literature. I think I may have said this yesterday, but in 2004, Gukov, Waffa, and Schwartz made a proposal for a physical interpretation of Kovanov homology in terms of spaces of BPS states. And that was based on previous work of physicists going back to Ugri and Waffa. In fact, Ugri and Waffa in 1998 introduced vector spaces associated to knots in, our, in a three sphere. And in hindsight, their vector spaces was, were the Kovanov homology, basically. That's the 2004 paper basically said that this construction was equivalent to Kovanov homology. So, uh, the description I'll be explaining, uh, I believe, should be essentially equivalent to what was said in 2004. Uh, I understand it better. It's, I think, a little more down to earth. And um, it's much closer to gauge theory. But but I, 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 like I said, I, I, it, it's meant to be a reinterpretation of what was said six years ago. OK. Now, I, I found it by starting with Gukov, Waffa, and Schwartz and trying to uh, re-express it more in the language of gauge theory. So I found that to be hard work, but I eventually got an answer. But in thinking about today's lecture, I decided it would be easier to go backwards. I haven't lectured about this before. Uh, okay. I gave a lecture a few months ago in Berkeley where I only said what the answer. I explained what will be the, last, the final part of this lecture. But I didn't understand the intermediate steps. So this is the first time I've explained the intermediate steps in a lecture, so I don't know how it will go. But I've decided to do it backwards from the original logic starting with Trent Simon's theory and trying to see how to introduce time into it. I thought it would be more straightforward. So um, <clears throat> we, start with, we start with the path integral of Trent Simon's theory. <coughs> so I'm going to be very schematic. I don't think you'd, uh, if I actually uh, tried to explain all the details on the blackboard, you wouldn't find it to be much fun. Uh, I'll just be schematic and explain what are the main ideas. So this is the path integral we want to study. But the first step is going to be to find a new integration cycle for that path integral, just like yesterday. In fact, we gave yesterday's lecture. So we'd know how to find new integration cycles for path integrals. So we complexify the field over which we're integrating. So uh, we just replace A by curly A. And instead of integrating over all real fields, we're going to integrate over a middle dimensional space of complex gauge fields. So we've analytically continued the integration, the form which is being integrating, integrated, which is now a homomorphic differential form of top dimension in an infinite dimensional space. And now we need to find a real integration cycle for the path integral of Chern Simon's theory. I actually did this in a paper six months ago. And
the motivation at the time was to account for a lot of results found by uh, well, from a physics point of view, largely by Gukov, but there are a lot of mathematicians who have worked on it as well. There are a lot of results I thought were striking about the analytic continuation of chern simons theory as a function of k. Physically, k starts out life as an integer. But as I told you implicitly, the answers when you compute them turn out to be, well, as I said, a Laurent polynomial in Q. So in particular, they have an analytic continuation as a function of k. The analytic continuation has striking properties. And well, I was unhappy at not understanding those properties, and I wrote a paper where I introduced a new integration cycle in trans-Simons theory to explain them. So uh, I'll, I'll go over that construction in a second. Our goal today is to use the same new integration cycle, not to account for peculiar properties of the Jones polynomial found after analytic continuation, but rather to lift it up eventually to Kavanov theory in an extra dimension. So, you know, the trouble with this integral is that um, the exponent has a real part which isn't bounded above, so it's in danger of diverging. So we do the same thing um, we did yesterday. We let h be the real part of this. h is the real part of the exponent, and we're going to use h as a Morse function. And then we're going to solve flow equations to define an integration cycle. And um, we'll put a metric on the space of fields, which will be the integral over our three manifold of the trace of delta A wedge star delta A, star delta A bar. That's a Kähler metric on the space of fields. We have to pick, it uses the star operator, so I've picked an ordinary Riemannian metric on M3 in order to put a Riemannian metric on the space of complex fields. But just as yesterday, if we change the metric on the three manifold a little bit, we'll just change the resulting integration cycle a little bit. So let me write this. That's another version of the same formula. So explicitly, it makes use of a Riemannian metric on the three manifold. So as yesterday, we pick an auxiliary Riemannian metric to define our integration cycle. But the integral over that integration cycle is invariant under wiggling the integration cycle a little bit by the infinite dimensional analog of Cauchy's theorem. And therefore, we'll get results independent of the metric on the three manifold. Now we write the flow equation which says that dA dt, d, okay, I'll call the variable, okay. maybe I'll, okay. I'll keep with yesterday's notation, so I'll call the flow direction S. We write the equation that dA dS is minus delta H delta A. So in principle, we'll do exactly what we did yesterday. And define an integration cycle by integrating on a half line. So here's the three manifold we're really interested in. And then we go to M3 times the half line in S space from minus infinity to 0. Here's S equals 0. And here's S equals minus infinity. The cycle gamma consists of all values at s equals 0 of solutions of the flow equation on r plus times m3. And 
just as yesterday, we'll then do a modified turn time and spread integral where we integrate over this cycle. And then we could introduce various auxiliary fields, bosons and fermions, to promote it to a four-dimensional integral that will be supported on that integration cycle. Now, in general, okay, we need boundary conditions in the past. And the boundary conditions of the past are to start at a critical point. And in general, we'll get an integration cycle for each critical point, or if the critical points are not isolated, for each middle dimensional cycle in the space of critical points. But if M3 is R3, the only critical point is A equals 0 up to gauge transformation. So for the special case of knots in R3, there's only one critical point we can use. And since there's only one critical point we can use, there's only one integration cycle we can use. And therefore, although my description sounds a little bit odd, our integral is equivalent to the standard integral for turn simons theory for knots in R3. Since it is equivalent to the standard integration cycle, you could ask if there's some way you could have arrived at it more quickly without giving yesterday's lecture and all this explanation about flow equations. So what happens to you if you're a physicist doing the turn simons integral? You write A as a sum of C numbers times modes, C numbers C lambda times modes A lambda of the gauge field. Then our path integral is an integral over C lambdas. And in the quadratic approximation, what we're integrating is an oscillatory Gaussian. And then when you take a quantum field theory course, you'd probably be told to make a wick rotation for each mode C lambda so as to get to a convergent Gaussian. The n lambdas can be either positive or negative. So the wick rotation will be a pi over 4, I guess, rotation in one direction or the other, depending on the sign of n lambda. So you'll be told when you learn about perturbation theory for path integrals that you can make the integral convergent, at least in the quadratic approximation, by a wick rotation in field space. What I've explained is just a non-perturbative version of that. So in the quadratic approximation, the integration cycle I've described is simply the one you would get by rotating each mode by pi over 4 in the complex plane, making the integral into a convergent Gaussian. But we've done it non-perturbatively. I mean, okay. the first thing is that in your courses, they don't usually tell you what to do in the next order, but probably you could figure it out. But not just order by order, but non-perturbatively. Uh, I've defined an integration cycle where the integral is convergent. So if we had looked at some situation other than knots in R3, there would have been, according to the Poincaré conjecture, as more recently proved, there would have been different critical points corresponding to non-trivial classical solutions. And when there are different critical points, we'd have had to make a choice of our boundary condition at infinity. And then we'd have needed, later on in the lecture, to learn what happens to that choice under electric magnetic duality. However, for knots in R3, there wasn't a choice to make. There was only one integration cycle, and it's equivalent to the usual integration cycle. Um, any questions? So you just provided us with an outline of how to generalize your lecture to a different lecture. What's the other lecture? Where we do another three manifold? Well, we have to do some work. In other words, <laughs> there is a paper by Mons Henningsen who, in, in this language, took M3 to be a three torus and got some information about how the critical points transform under electric magnetic duality. However, there's very little information on that. Uh, uh, he, I'm not sure how close he was to a complete story for T3, and I don't know of anything anyone's done for other three manifolds. So um, we, we've got a potential goal for other lectures, but I can't, it's not straightforward. So, could you say one more time, where does, where does the cycle lie? 
it lies in the space of complex value gauge fields on a three manifold. Right? So the ordinary Feynman integral yesterday was over the real loop space, the real free loop space. But then we replaced the real free loop space by the free loop space of the complexification. And then we took an integration cycle there consisting of I pseudo holomorphic curves. So um, for Chern Simon's theory, we replace the real valued connection, in other words, the gauge group being a compact Lie group, by the Chern Simon's form for the corresponding complex form of the Lie group. And then in the space of complex gauge fields, we have defined an integration cycle. So, um, see. We've got this holomorphic function in the numerator. And it's the exponential of h, which is bounded above. And then it's got a phase. I haven't proved this, but the phase is actually constant on this integration cycle. So on this integration cycle, what we're integrating is a real exponentially decaying function. Yes. Yes. It's a, the flow equation has a conserved quantity. And the conserved quantity is precisely the phase of the, the imaginary part of the exponent of the path integral. We're not, in principle. Yes. In, my, in a continuation of yesterday's lecture, we would have included some Hamiltonians. Then it's not topological. So, well, you could include any Hamiltonian, but you get something complicated. But there's a class, a special class of Hamiltonians, where miracles happen, and you get something nice. So complicated the flow equations with the intractable in general. They, well, well, I'm defining nice to mean that the flow equations have two-dimensional symmetry. You, you can always do this, but the only nice thing I've told you is that the flow equations had two-dimensional symmetry yesterday. That doesn't work for a generic Hamiltonian. But there are Hamiltonians for which it works. A typical example is that if the Hamiltonian, in our example yesterday of the two-sphere, if the Hamiltonian generates a rotation, if the Hamiltonian is one of the generators of angular momentum, then the flow equation has two-dimensional symmetry. So, yes, yes, yes. I, as far as I know, it will be correct, but I, it's up to you whether you can learn anything from it. Uh, yes, but in general, you have to sum over all critical points. You see, there's a physically motivated integration cycle, which is the real axis, the space of real fields. Then to every critical point, you associate an integration cycle. You can ask the question, and it's answered in my paper of six months ago, um, given the real integration cycle, how do you express it as a sum of critical point cycles? So there is a recipe, but in a generic non-topological theory, you'd have trouble making that recipe concrete. It happens that for Chern Simon's theory on R3, there's only one integration cycle, since there's only one critical point. So the integration cycle that comes from the critical point is the physical integration cycle on the nose. Yes? Yes, connections, yes. It's half dimensional because, in general, you see, we took the real part of a holomorphic function as a Morse function. So the integration cycle is always half dimensional. Moreover, this is qualitatively what Floor does in Floor theory. Um, but if it's half dimensional, it's dimensional. That's right. Um, Yes, it's, the metric I picked is a Kähler metric. So there is a symplectic form, and it's Lagrangian with respect to that symplectic form. And the, what I've been calling the steepest descent flow can be interpreted. I've been interpreting it as the Morse theory flow with respect to H, but it's also the Hamiltonian flow with respect to phi, which is why phi is conserved. I mentioned before that phi is a constant on the integration cycle. That's because, in general, in this type of Kähler situation, the Morse theory flow with respect to the real part of the holomorphic function is the Hamiltonian flow with respect to the imaginary part. So the imaginary part is conserved along the flow. Okay. And this cycle you described back in the four manifold has connections having certain properties yes. on the surface as well. Well, 
Sorry. Donaldson theory. Let's see. Donaldson theory is localized on solutions of the instanton equation. You could introduce a surface. It won't help, though. It's better to discuss Donaldson theory without the surface. Donaldson theory is localized on solutions of the instanton equation. So the question you should ask me is, what is this localized on? And the answer is, it's localized on solutions of the flow equation. So Fleur interpreted the flow, uh, well, Fleur among others, but he used it in a context somewhat similar to this, interpreted the instanton equation as the flow equation for the real Chern Simons function, whereas we are instead doing the flow equation for the real part of the complex Chern Simons function. So we're doing something qualitatively similar to what Fleur did, but with twice as many variables. The doubling of the variables is important, though. No one has ever interpreted the, infinite, the middle dimensional cycles that Fleur studied as integration cycles for an integral. I don't know how to do that. Because I don't know a nice integral that's supposed to be defined on half a half dimensional space of connections on a three manifold. But, you see, I do know an integral that's supposed to be defined on a half dimensional space of complex connections on a three manifold. Because the real connections are half dimensional in the space of complex connections. So if we, we're defining a middle dimensional cycle essentially the same way Fleur did, but unlike the case that he and many mathematicians studied, it is appropriate to use the integration cycle we're going to get, the, the cycle we're going to get, as an integration cycle for a path integral. So um, um, there's a tr trick involved, which is actually explained in my paper, but I'm, I'm going to kind of suppress it today. But um, If you ask, see, okay, I mentioned the case of Fleur. So, Fleur studied this equation for a real connection. With the real chern simons form. So, the equation was that dA dS. I'm going to write it in physical notation. So dA dS was the magnetic field, but dA dS is the electric field in the gauge where A sub S is zero. This is the electric field. And this was the magnetic field. So the flow equation for real turn Simons theory says that the electric field equals the magnetic field, or in um, Covariant language, it says that the self-dual part of the curvature is zero. So the, in the case that Fleur did, the flow equation for real turn Simons has a, what might be a miraculous looking four-dimensional symmetry. <coughs> so the same thing happens here. In this case, the flow equation has a miraculous looking four-dimensional symmetry which I explained in the previous paper, but didn't really use. Today, we're going to be using it. So this equation turns into the following equation. We're going to have twice as many variables. So A is a real valued connection. So what we're not going to do is just replace A by a complex valued connection in four dimensions. The reason is that since we've picked a Kähler metric, things aren't going to be holomorphic. Um, the flow equations aren't holomorphic. Sorry. This is a better, more careful way to write the flow equations. There's a Kähler metric involved, so dA dS is the variation of H with respect to A bar. And it, um, so the flow equations aren't holomorphic, but still the values, variables are doubled. So there's a connection, and there's also a one form with values in the adjoint representation, which I usually call phi. And the flow equations have four-dimensional symmetry. They're a system of elliptic differential equations. for A and phi.
So not only do they have four-dimensional symmetry, but uh, these are equations I'd run into before. Because, so Kaposin and I, when we studied geometric Langlands, had a four-dimensional theory that was somewhat analogous to Donaldson theory, but the field variables were doubled. And the analog, the topological field theory related to those equations is the one that's relevant to geometric Langlands. So these equations are the analog of the instanton equations for geometric Langlands. I'm simplifying slightly because you can introduce, in our paper we had a one parameter generalization of these equations with the parameter that we called t. But t equals 1 was the, okay, the parameter corresponds to doing what people in that field call quantum geometric Langlands. t equals 1 corresponds to what is sometimes called classical or ordinary geometric Langlands. And these are the equations for t equals 1. So these are the most basic equations that come up in the analog of Donaldson theory for geometric Langlands. So a slightly oversimplified version of what I'm telling you today is that the topological field theory that's relevant to Kovanov is the same as the one that's relevant to geometric Langlands. It's oversimplified because we'll have to introduce a fifth dimension in a little while. Any questions? Yes. You could think of it that way, but the equations aren't holomorphic in A plus I phi. So this corresponds to the A-like model, and under S duality goes to a B model that is holomorphic in A plus I phi. That's a t equals i in the language of our previous paper. But at t equals 1, there's no holomorphy in a plus i phi, so it, you may or may not consider it natural to combine them like that. Yes? There are two things you can do. The simpler one is to simply regard the knot as part of the holomorphic function you're trying to integrate over this integration cycle. So I'm presenting this lecture that way. That was like what we had yesterday. We had functions that are called ui of ti that were boundary insertions. We computed the trace of the product of operators. We assumed implicitly that the u's didn't grow fast enough at infinity to affect the convergence of the path integral. And we didn't include them in the Morse theory. So I'm approaching it that way today, and I think it's more elementary. However, it's actually closer to what you did and to what Ugri and Vafa did to include the flow equations, to include the knot in the flow equations, which I did in my paper on Trent Simons theory six months ago, and which we can do here. It's longer to explain. And then there will be several integration cycles. I think, um, I think for today we're best off just thinking of the holonomy as part of the function that we're integrating on an integration cycle that's independent of the choice of the knot. Any other questions? So we've introduced a fourth, okay. Sorry. I've kind of given the answer away okay. without telling it to you. Um, what we had yesterday was we had an ordinary Feynman integral in a circle. We promoted the circle to a cylinder. Then we introduced a lot of additional variables to interpret the delta function that we needed to get us our integration cycle as coming from a path integral. So we can do the same thing today, but you can kind of guess the answer. The flow equations are equations for supersymmetry in a twisted version of n equals 4 super Yang mills. That's how Kaposin and I ran into them. So the theory on m3 times r plus is n equals 4 super Yang mills with the twist related to geometric Langlands. If M3 isn't flat, to, or if there's a knot, to preserve some supersymmetry, we need to make a topological twist. And the twist that leads to these flow equations 
is the one that's relevant to geometric line lengths. So, so just like I explained yesterday, that the path integral of the two-dimensional sigma model on the cylinder localizes on a one-dimensional path integral with a funny integration cycle. There's the same story here. The path integral of four-dimensional superyang mills on the cylinder localizes on three-dimensional Chern-Simons with a funny integration cycle. If M3 is R3, the funny integration cycle is a wick-rotated version of the usual one, but otherwise it's something different. So we've promoted Chern-Simons theory, the Chern-Simons path integral, to a path integral in four dimensions, on a half space, while maintaining four-dimensional symmetry. But it's not immediately relevant for getting Kavanov, because Well, for one thing, if we tried to define a Hilbert space where this is regarded as the time direction, we wouldn't even see the knot that only lives on the boundary. So, in fact, we'd get something trivial. So, to get Kavanov theory, we're going to have to do something else with this. Now, to motivate what we can do, it's convenient to, take, to consider the case that the gauge group is UN for some N. Okay. So, 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 for any gauge group, so, the integration cycle we want has this delta function on this space of solutions of the flow equations. And just like yesterday, by introducing a lot more bosonic and fermionic fields, we can express the three-dimensional path integral on that integration cycle as a, an integration, a path integral in R3 times R plus, with a theory that in this case turns out to be n equals 4 super yang mills theory. Yesterday, we started with a purely bosonic quantum mechanics problem and got a sigma model of a hypercalar target space. So it had a lot of supersymmetry. Today we started with a purely bosonic Chern-Simons theory, and the corresponding four-dimensional theory is n equals four superangles. <clears throat> but we want to um, use that as a starting point for getting Kavanov theory. And to motivate what we're going to do, we'll consider the special case that G is UN. And I will first tell you something that doesn't work, after which I will tell you something that does work. So first of all, UN gauge theory on a four-manifold can come from N parallel D3 brains. But here, the D3s end on an NS5. As well, the bulk theory has a non-zero theta angle. In fact, theta is essentially k, 2 pi k. So the boundary condition for D3s ending on NS5s is simple if theta is zero. But if theta isn't zero, the boundary conditions for D3s ending on NS5s is tricky. Actually, Davide Gariotto and I described it a couple years ago. And it's a kind of four-dimensional analog of the coisotropic brain of Kaposin and Orlov that came up yesterday in two dimensions. So the physical situation we're discussing is D3s that end on an NS5. The path integral of the UN gauge theory on the D3s is the one that gives us UN Chern-Simons theory on the boundary. Mm 
Now, I'm going to suggest a tempting procedure for introducing a time coordinate. So, the tempting procedure, okay, first of all, I maybe should explain the geometry a little better. So, the, the, the 10-dimensional space-time is actually the cotangent bundle of M3 times R4. The reason we need to take the cotangent bundle of M3 is that as M3 is curved, generically M3 would break supersymmetry, but if we take the cotangent bundle of M3, we restore super, some supersymmetry. Uh, even if M3 is flat, like R3, there's a knot in it. And that would generically break supersymmetry, but essentially by going to the cotangent bundle, you fix it. So the NS5 brain is supported on T star M3 times the origin, where the origin is a point in R4. And the D3 is supported on M3 inside T star M3 times a half line. So L is a half line from uh, the origin in R4 to infinity. Inside R4, there is a half line, L. So um, our D3 brains live on the zero section of the cotangent bundle times L. That's a four manifold with boundary. The boundary is M3 times the origin, which is contained in the NS5. So we have D3s that end on an NS5. So now I'm going to tell you something that doesn't work, but it doesn't work in an instructive way which will help us get something that does work. When we find the right thing to do, we can do it for any g. But it just happens that when g is un, we can use these brain constructions as a clue to what we ought to do. So we're going to replace R4 by R3 times a circle. So now we're on T star M3 times R3 times a circle. And nothing changes except we take L to be in R3 times a fixed point P in S1. So there is a circle, but L runs in the perpendicular direction inside R3 times a circle. And this doesn't modify our calculation of the physics on the brains at all. For example, the circle could have a radius of a light year, and the gauge theory that lives on the brains doesn't know about it. So we've neither gained nor lost anything. Now we're going to do something else that will neither gain nor lose us anything. We'll do t-duality on the circle. Maybe I should say that we're in type 2b superstring theory, because that's the theory that has d3 brains. Now we do t-duality on the circle, and the d3 now will go to a d4. The ns5 will still be an ns5. Oh, sorry. We'll discuss what happens to the ns5 in a second. That statement wasn't true. So now we will still be uh, asymptotically, we'll still be on T star M3 times R3 times S1. It's actually only true asymptotically, as I'll tell you in a second. But if we ignore the NS5 brain, let's for the moment ignore the NS5 brain. So asymptotically means way off, far away at, at, on L from the NS5 brain then the NS5 brain is unimportant. T-duality maps a circle to a circle. And now the D3 brain becomes a D4 that lives on M3 times L times a circle.
Now, we're, now I'll tell you the false statements, which if it were true, would lead us to what we might have wanted. The false statement would lead to say that this is the compactification on a circle of something. And that something would then be the theory that leads to Kovanov homology. This is, in fact, false. Because in the presence of the NS5 brain, the t-duality is modified. It gives a circle asymptotically. But in general, it gives not a product of R3 times a circle, but a four-manifold that maps to R3 with circle fibers. And with the NS5 brain, so asymptotically, we had this. But the exact story is T star N3 times a hypercalar 4 manifold known as the Taub Nut manifold. I'll just call it TN. TN is a hypercalar manifold. It maps to R3 with generic fiber being a circle. But there's a bad fiber at the origin where the circle collapses to a point. So in fact, when I said that the D4, um, oh, OK. So I'll correct two statements I've made. Only one correction really causes things to go wrong. The D4 asymptotically is on L times S1 times N3. But actually, the D4 is on M3 times Something that looks like this. Something that metrically looks like a long cigar. Asymptotically, it's a circle times L. But in the interior, the circle shrinks to a point. So that's the corrected version of the statement about where the D4 lives. It lives on a manifold that looks like that inside the tab nut space. So okay, I'm telling you. I'm telling you standard facts about t-duality for NS5 rent on a circle and tab nut spaces. Some of you will be familiar with those facts. Others will have to take what I'm saying on faith, on faith because there isn't really time for a full explanation. But the important thing is that this cigar manifold is simply connected, so we can't take a cover to decompactify the circle. And therefore, we can't get to Kovanov homology. Yes? Can I ask if the turn sign is level effectively uh, can Yes. Um, the churn simons level comes, through the theta, comes from the theta angle of the type 2b theory. So under t-duality, it turns into the holonomy of a Ramundramon 1 form around the circle. And there's some Ramundramon curvature at the end, which is a self-dual 2 form on the tab nut space, so it preserves supersymmetry, I think. Uh, any other questions? Yes? Yes, I'm afraid it's, uh, it, it often causes confusion. But in the conventional notation, time isn't counted. So the D3 brain fills three space in one time dimension. So and D4, is, is that entire space? Or is it no, the D4 also will fill five dimensions. Yes. Well, and the entire that's right. Except that the L cross S1 is only an asymptotic description. It's actually M3 times a cigar. And it's because of the fact that the geometry is really a cigar that this attempt to introduce a time coordinate doesn't work. But um, that happened to us because of the funny way the NS5 brain turns into geometry under t-duality. So we're going to now perform s-duality before t-duality. We'll take the s-dual. We'll take the s dual of that configuration. So now we'll be well, still in type 2b. The only real change is that the ns5 becomes a d5. So pursuing the answer to your question, the ns5 and d5 were both supported on a 6 manifold, which was t star of m3 times a point. So now the picture is we've got D3s ending on, on a D5. Hmm. 
And now we're going to do a t-duality again. And what we've gained is that d5s don't do anything funny. They don't mix with geometry under t-duality. They just turn into d6s. So the t-dual will be a d4, d6 system. So the d6 is supported on t star m3 times the origin in R3 times a circle. And D4 is supported on M3 times L times the circle. Well, there's still a theta angle. There's also a trick that has to do with the parameter that Kaposit and I had. I think it's better to not give a full answer right now. So we have to worry about what the theta angle does, and then we get a nice answer. Um, <clears throat> so, um, okay. so now there's no monkey business. This really is a product of a circle times something else. And therefore, we c therefore the path integral is simply a trace of a Hilbert space that we would have gotten in my terminology if the circle is replaced by R. But Mike Friedman wanted us correctly to say that the Hilbert space is associated with an initial value surface that is a point in R. Or if you want, a point in the circle. So picking a point in the circle, as in, regarded as an initial value surface in this five manifold, we'd have a Hilbert space. And that Hilbert space is the candidate for Kovanov homology. Now, uh, we, can, we, we have to worry about what happens to the knot in this process. So the knot in this process was the boundary of an elementary string that ended on M3, ended on the D3 brain. The S-duality turned it into a D1 brain that ends on the M3 brain. And then the T-duality turned it into a D2 brain. So as well as the D4s and the D6s, there's actually a D2. The D2 is supported on our knot C times time. Or I have, if we don't decompactify it, it's just S1 times another half line that ends at the origin. So the D4 is ending on the D6 to give us our gauge theory. But if a knot is present, it means that a D2 is ending on the D4. So D2 is ending on D4 brains, in general, give us a hoofed operators in the gauge theory. So We've got D4 brains on a half line, and they've got hoofed operators on the boundary. It's just a T star of M3 times R3 times a circle. And it's got some brains in it. I gave a reasonable explanation of the brains with the knot suppressed. And then there's one more brain because of the knot. Well, sorry, I shouldn't have said this was L1 tilde. So C is inside T star of M3. So then we've got T star of C. Sorry, C is a knot in M3, which is in T star of M3. So T star of C is inside T star of M3. And the D2 is actually supported on T star C times S1. Yeah. 
Yes. Now, I prefer to think of decompactifying S1 to R, but in any case, everything is independent of one dimension, which is why we assign a Hilbert space to this situation. That Hilbert space depends on M3 and also the knot. It's really this stuff here. It's not the normal bundle. What's that? It says T star C inside of T star M3. Yes. It's not the normal No. If T star of M3 is a complex manifold, then T star C would be a complex Riemann surface in T star M3. So, uh, so, so, what are, so we've got, so we have UN gauge theory on the D4s, which we think of as being on M3 times a half line times time, and quantizing in this situation gives a Hilbert space associated to M3 times R plus. We also have D2, um, which are supported, well, the, D2, the important thing about the D2s is where they end. The D2s end on C inside M3 times the endpoint S equals 0 in R plus times time. So the whole thing is time independent. And if you draw a picture at time zero, which is more, a little bit more manageable, the picture at time zero is that we have a three manifold with a knot in it. And the three manifold is the boundary of a four manifold that's just M3 times R plus. We're supposed to do gauge theory on the R plus in the presence of an Hooft operator. The Hooft operator lives in co-dimension 3, namely it lives on a knot in the boundary. The knot is a 1 manifold, which is a co-dimension 3 in the 4 manifold, M3 times R plus. And now we need to construct the physical Hilbert space associated to this situation. And the recipe we get is one that actually is very similar to floor theory in the case of Donaldson theory or in the case of symplectic manifolds. So it's, the recipe is one that one would expect could be made completely rigorous mathematically. Although the explanation of why it's equivalent to Kovanov theory would not be completely rigorous. Um, I'm going to write down some equations just to make it clear that there are completely explicit equations, but I don't think there's time to explain all the details of how I got them and the little odd bits I do or don't know about them. But, um, so, I'll write the equations in a little bit more generality, though. In general, we could be on M4 times R plus. So, from the odd hoke way, in my lecture, M4, has been M3 times a circle, which is how we got it first by T-duality, or M3 times R if we decompactify. But in fact, you can replace M3 times a circle by a general four-manifold while preserving one supersymmetry. So as I said in my answer to Mike Friedman yesterday, we, the theory actually has four-dimensional topological invariants. It's formulated on a four-manifold M4 times R plus. And it um, only depends on the smooth structure of M4. Although, if I had to guess, okay, well, let me not guess. I'm skeptical of whether it depends on the smooth structure in an interesting way. So, before we discuss Hilbert spaces, the recipe would be, first of all, to associate numerical invariants to M4 times R plus. M4 times R plus could have a two manifold that would be D with the, the product of a two manifold times zero. The two manifold lives in M4. And 
zero is the boundary in, of R plus. The two manifold is the support of an Etoft operator. The precise boundary conditions at the boundary of R plus are complicated. If there's time, I'll describe them. But I first want to write down what happens away from the boundary. Or, in fact, I'll first describe it, ignoring the question of the boundary conditions. The fields are a gauge field A. So it's a connection on a G dual bundle E over M, M4 times R plus. It's a G dual bundle where G, I see, G was the gauge group in the Chern Simons description. But we did S duality, which corresponded to electric magnetic duality, to get to this other description. So in this description, the gauge group is the Langlands or GNO dual. And then there's another field, B, which is a section over M4 times R plus of omega 2 plus of M4. Well, the pullback, omega 2, omega 2 is the bundle of self dual, sorry, omega 2 is the bundle of two forms on M4. Omega 2 plus is the bundle of self dual two forms. We pull back this bundle of self dual two forms to the product M4 times R plus. And then we twist that by the adjoint bundle derived from E. So B lives there. And now I'm going to write down a system of elliptic differential equations. These equations are the analog of the instanton equations of Donaldson. And they also are the generalizations of the flow equations, the four-dimensional flow equations that we had earlier in the lecture. The equations say that F plus plus what I'll write as B times B um, is equal to the covariant derivative in the S direction of B. What B times B means is the following. Omega 2 plus is a real rank 3 bundle. So it's anti-symmetric exterior power is isomorphic to itself. And composing that with the commutator in the Lie algebra, B is Lie algebra valued. There's a symmetric product, there's a symmetric function quadratic in B, which I'm writing as B cross B. So B cross B lives in the same place that B does. It's a self-dual two form valued in the adjoint representations, just like the self-dual part of the curvature. So we can add them. And the covariant derivative of B in the S direction, in the R plus direction, also lives in the same place. So that equation makes sense, at least. And then the other equation is that star of dB, I have trouble writing this part of the equation. We take the curvature, the curvature on M4 times R plus has a part which is a two form on M4 pulled back, but it has a part which is a one form on our M4 times a one form dS. So we take the coefficient of dS, maybe sorry. physicists won't like this, but mathematicians would say that you take the vector field d by dS and contract it with the curvature to get something which is a section of the pullback of the bundle of one forms on M4. And then well, if you interpret star as being a star along M4, <clears throat> or even if you write the ordinary star, we could write the equation like that. Anyway, there is a system of elliptic differential equations. <clears throat> so, roughly speaking, the invariant you assign to M4 is the number of solutions of that equation in the same sense that Donaldson counted the number of solutions of the instanton equation. 
When I say roughly speaking, the reason is that each solution gets weighted by a sign plus or minus one, depending on the sign of a certain fermion determinant. Also, um, we can weight this. We have an instanton number, h, which is the, second, the integral corresponding to the second churn class. We want to count the number of solutions for given h. So if a n is the number of solutions for given n, for given for h equals n, then the partition function of m4 is the sum of a n q to the n. Where q is just a formal variable we introduce to write a generating series. If m4 is m3 times a circle, this is supposed to be the Jones polynomial. If you ask where the knot entered, it entered in the boundary condition that I didn't describe. We had elliptic differential equations with some subtle but sensible boundary conditions that depend on the knot. We count the solutions with those boundary conditions. And then when m4 is m3 times a circle, that's supposed to give us the Jones polynomial. Can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, so in this picture, you have m3 equals r, r, r plus. Yes. Yes, I've done that here. What? M this picture we suppress time. So I drew the picture at constant time, so it was really R times M three times R plus. And then I generalized R times M three to a general M four. I didn't go through the exercise of explaining why it was still supersymmetric. It would have had to do with G two holonomy, actually. A seven ma the fact that the bundle omega 2 plus of M4 has an almost G2 structure. So, so you're not finding a vector space in this one? Well, I will find a vector space in a second. Uh, I've explained the analog of Donaldson theory, but to get vector spaces, we have to do the analog of floor theory. So, what is floor theory? Well, floor, um, the classical approximation, is he introduced chain groups, but the classical approximation is, okay. Let me say it physically. You want to find the supersymmetric ground states of the system. In the classical approximation, they come from time independent solutions of the instanton equation, which are flat connections on a three manifold. So mathematically, he introduced chain groups with a basis corresponding to the flat connection. Then you need quantum corrections due to instantons. Those give tunneling amplitudes between them. So you, that enabled him to define a differential in the space of those chain groups, whose homology was the space of exact quantum ground states. So we have to imitate that, where the first step, so the chain groups in mathematical language, or the classical approximation to the ground states, come from the time independent solutions. So we specialize the story I've just told you to R3 times time. Then we take those time independent solutions of these elliptic differential equations that got erased, I'm afraid. So assuming there are no moduli, the time independent solutions give a basis for the chain groups, just like in Fleur's case. And then we define a differential by counting time-dependent solutions. Time-dependent solutions. A time-dependent solution can flow from one time-independent solution in the past to another in the future. So to get the matrix element of the differential between states that correspond to two time-independent solutions, we count the time-dependent solutions. Counting is in the following sense. A time-dependent solution always has one modulus due to time translations. We remove it. We look at time translational orbits of time-dependent solutions. And then after removing that modulus, you can attach a sign to such a um, thing coming from the sign of a fermion determinant. 
So then you count the time-dependent orbits of time-dependent solutions weighted by the right signs. And that gives the matrix element of the supersymmetry operator between approximate quantum ground states. And that enables you to define the differential whose homology is supposed to be Kavanov homology. From a mathematical point of view, it will be out of reach in the near future to justify the arguments by which I claim that this procedure will be equivalent to, by which I claim that the trace in this space will be the trans simons thing. There might be other arguments that could be made rigorous, but not the ones I've explained. But mathematically, the assertion that this will give vector spaces associated to a three manifold should be within reach, a three manifold with a knot. Because it's simply the analog of floor theory with a different system of partial differential equations, which I believe are actually better behaved than the instanton equations. They have much less, I believe there will be much less trouble with uh, bubbling phenomena. I think probably this is a reasonable place to stop. Possibly. I must say that I find well, Kalvanov homology was defined by Kalvanov and many other definitions have been found, variants have been found by him and others later. Um, not with this kind of machinery that's manifestly topologically invariant, but by giving rules for gluing things together. So all definitions of Kalvanov theory have come with an effective method of calculation. So the methods might look cumbersome, but they're effective. Given a knot, you can actually calculate the Kavanov groups. Here, this is manifestly invariant, but it doesn't come with an effective method to calculate. Um, since all uh, approaches to co- where you can calculate in Kavanov theory have to do with stretching things and factoring on a two-manifold, I've tried to imitate that here. Something nice happens to the equations. It's very reminiscent of what's been done Oh my gosh. I'm suffering from a slight mental block. Oh, sorry, by Kamnitzer, Seidel, and Smith, and others. Uh, I get equations such as they've studied, but with different boundary conditions. So I haven't quite been successful in deducing from this a known method of calculation. But uh, for the most part, my goal is to give some reasonable explanation of why this gives one of the known methods of calculation. Mathematically, if you could do that, I feel it's imaginable that you could, but certainly I haven't been able to see a good scenario. If you could that, do that, then you might have, although it wouldn't be a conceptual proof of why it was related to the Jones polynomial, it could be a conceptual proof of why this was equivalent to one of the standard methods of computing. Yes? Yes. Well, we're not going to get anything that um, wasn't true before. Um, uh, the answer is surely yes, but the right explanation isn't coming to mind, so I won't, I won't try to give you more of an answer right now. Sorry, remember, though, that... Um, In Chern Simon's theory, for knots on R3, you can do things that you can't usually do. And that's related to the fact that, in general, there are the other critical points. And the other critical points here would have come in in an essential way, because under S duality, the critical point with A equals zero that we used would mix with other critical points in ways that have not been analyzed in the literature. I don't know much about what would happen. So uh, part of a complete answer to you will be that better things happen when we're on R3. Yes? Yes. In mathematics, there's also a finite type of environment which is expanded around the trivial connection. Yes. It's possible to get new to a finite type of my different environment by doing other. Well, that question has nothing to do with my lecture. Yeah, 
but um, the, the answer is yes in trans alignment theory in general. So I, I'm a little surprised if it's not known in the literature. But in any case, technically, finite type might not be the right terminology. But there are perturbative trans alignments invariants expanding around any critical point. Yes. Yes. Where uh, essentially uh, choosing a path, uh, a type of integration in the original term is yes. naturally to this twisted form of an echo for yes. super young, you know, right. right? On the other hand, you now have this five dimensional. Uh, yes. So I'm, I'm kind of, I want to come to my more on the connection. How did I connect them? Yes. Well, the, uh, so I have two options in answering. So. For the case where it could be realized by D, D3 brains, um, I um, used S duality and T duality. So S, uh, we went from four to five dimensions by T duality. But we found that it only worked nicely if we did S duality first. Otherwise, things got twisted in a way we didn't like. But the narrow answer to your question is that in the lecture, I went from four to five dimensions with standard string theory dualities. Electric magnetic duality followed by T duality. I'm tempted to tell you something else, though. Okay. I'll use your question as an excuse to say something else. So, you see, the explanation I gave of how to compute the invariance might have satisfied mathematicians, I think potentially could because it involved counting solutions of elliptic differential equations that are going to be well behaved with these boundary conditions. But physicists would not be entirely satisfied with that explanation because it involved five dimensional super Young Mills, which is unremormizable. So a physicist would ask for a more complete uh, extension of the theory in a quantum field theory that's actually well behaved. I'll give you that in a second, but I'll make an analogy first. In geometric Langlands, as done conventionally, if you ask simple situations, you get a simple answer. But if you ask more complicated situations, the algebra becomes more complicated. A physicist would say that the universal answer for geometric Langlands duality is S duality in N equals 4 super Young Mills. There might be something smaller that gives a universal answer, but there might not be. It might be that when you try to formulate it in sufficient generality, that you get the most general universal statements you want you would need the full n equals 4 super Young mills. I don't know if that's true or not, but certainly n equals 4 super Young mills is some place where you can make a universal statement that moreover is extremely simple. So um, part of the reason that's possible is that n equals 4 super Young mills is a well-defined quantum theory, which is much more than just having elliptic differential equations whose solutions we can count. So instead of uh, gauge theory on m4 times r plus, the good version of this is the six dimensional zero two theory on M four times the cigar. So there's a six dimensional supersymmetric theory that actually is well defined in the ultraviolet. And we formulate it on the sixth manifold, which is m4 times w. So you can do all kinds of things with this theory, but something that's been very popular in the recent literature, among other things, it leads to the AGT construction, which you've had lectures about here, and we'll have more. Gaiato considered the six dimensional theory on a product of a four manifold times a two manifold. He made a topological, he made a twist. Well, as he expressed it, he made a twist that preserved supersymmetry on m4. But you could further twist it to get a theory that's topological in M4 and holomorphic on C. So that twist, which is very natural in this, OK, the instanton counting on R4, to really justify it, one approach involves making the twist I just described. So we're making that twist here. But W is just this stupid cigar. We're not, nothing is varying with W. If we modified the problem so W had moduli, we'd get a holomorphic dependence on those moduli. But for Kovanov theory, we use the fact that W has a, a circle symmetry inside. So the real official version of this is the 0, 2 theory on M4 times the cigar. Now, um, 
to try to make this brief, suppose we're on M3 times a circle times the cigar. Well, that has a map to M3 times a line where the generic fiber is S1 times S1. There's a bad fiber at the tip of the cigar, but the generic fiber is S1 times S1. Now, where S-duality comes from is by compactifying the six-dimensional theory on S1 times S1 and reducing on one or the other S1 first. When you reduce on an S1, you get a gauge theory description. So here we get two descriptions by reducing on one circle or the other first. One involves the group and the other involves the dual group. But the cigar in which one shrinks and the other doesn't breaks the symmetry between the two. So we get two quite different descriptions. In the description by the group G, we eventually get churn simons theory. And the description by the group G dual, we get this other story I told you about with these elliptic differential equations. So. Well, if you want a four-dimensional topological theory, you can practify on this cigar. You need a boundary condition at infinity. You can, there's a variant of it where you replace the cigar by a two-sphere, and you don't need a boundary condition. It doesn't give Kavanov theory, but it gives something. It will still give not, invariant, not homologies that will be closely related. The reason we need the circle symmetry is that the Q variable keeps track of that circle symmetry. So we could have a different Riemann surface here, but then we would lose the dependence of the Jones polynomial and Kavanov theory on Q. Uh, unfortunately, it's kind of necessary to give another lecture to explain what I'm here calling the official version of this. But so the one-dimensional theory which worked, was at the end. Yes. That's the one which you would get by compactifying. That's the one which you get by reducing on this circle. So m4 times w maps to m4 times a half line by reducing on this circle. So for general m4, that's the only way to get to gauge theory. And we get the story that counts elliptic differential equations. If, however, m4 is m4, m3 times a circle, then there's a second circle in the game. And if we reduce on this circle, we get a description that eventually leads to churn simons theory on m3. Now, it leads to churn simons theory on m3 by a long route that involves that story about integration cycles and flow equations. Uh, 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 I'd better not give a quick answer, but in this description, you don't use t-duality in this version. Uh, this version is this version is an M-theory version. So, yeah, okay. You could go. You could close up a loop. Okay. The the t-duality gave us type two a, and then type two a on a ten manifold is related to M-theory on an eleven manifold. The way it works here is that the half line is replaced by the cigar. So in this description, we're in M theory, and we don't have T duality. So T duality is what we get if we first reduced on a circle to go back to string theory. Yes? Does your approach associate a five-dimensional vector space to a closed four-dimensional? No. Number. number, yes. I told how to compute the number. We we count solutions of the equations for each value of the second turn class. Those, so we get an infinite series of numbers. Yes. So it's a function of Q that we associate to a closed four manifold. How interesting. Uh, my guess is no, but in principle, I can't prove it doesn't. This, in this four manifold, we, we can include a knotted two manifold. I believe that's more likely to be interesting, but I don't know for sure. I don't know whether it will be non trivial. Well, Q is related to the level K of the Chern Simons theory. By central charge, did you mean the level K? Like the, the 
Well, there's a framing anomaly. Is that what you're asking about? I haven't really understood properly what the framing anomaly means here. I'm sorry to say. I believe, you see, when you calculate this integral of the second turn class, it's integrated over a non-compact manifold. And it also has a gravitational correction. So in spirit, I want to think of the framing anomaly as having to do with the fact that this integral depends on the boundary conditions. But I haven't been able to understand it properly. Yes? Yes. I don't believe there'll be essentially no. Uh, I, I haven't proved that, but I believe what the reason is. Well, I believe it will be qualitatively similar to to Peston's calculation on the four sphere. So it, it was built out of something at the North Pole and something at the South Pole, and. It didn't contain really new information, although they were combined together in an interesting way. So just to make sure I understood correctly, so if you want to get a covalent homology yes. to G, yes. you would have to take this five-dimensional theory. Yes. No, uh, sorry. It, well, let's discuss what we mean by covalent homology for the group G. Uh, turn Simon's theory for the group G, we know what that means. Then by Kovanov homology for the group G, we mean Kovanov homology where the supertrace will give turn Simon's theory of G. If that's what we mean by Kovanov homology of G, then to do Kovanov homology of G, we have to solve the PDs I described for the Langlands dual group. 